Jag vill hälsa er hjärtligt välkomna till det här första seminariet som tankeverksamheten inom arbetarrörelsen i Göteborg arrangerar. Eh, och vi är alltså en relativt nystartad tankesmedja eh, inom arbetarrörelsen i Göteborg. Och vi är mycket glada att som gäst här idag har Gösta Esping Andersson. Eh, och vi har ju givit ut ett kapitel ur Göstas senaste bok som en rapport. Eh, att investera i barn och utjämna livskanser. Men med det så vill jag gärna över scenen till Gösta. Eh, och eh, ja, ni vet väl vem Gösta är. Om ett annat så kan ni läsa i efterhållet här. Du är hjärtligt välkommen Gösta. Ja, ja, tack. So I have to speak English. Um, I hope uh, it's all right. But uh, I was, I, that was, those were doctor's orders. Um, some of us are getting old. Uh, not a lot here in this room, I can see. But uh, and we're getting a little bit worried about uh, who's going to pay our pension. There are not very many young kids around. And that means that we have to rely on the quality of our kids. And so that's my big worry. But I, I also think there's another thing that we should worry about, which is uh, what you might call equality of opportunity. And that fits together with the first concern. Uh, namely, if there is inequality of opportunity, it means a lot of children born today are not going to end up as brilliant and fantastic as they could in a society that would guarantee optimal equality of opportunity for all kids, irrespective of their origins, and only contingent on their talents. So our societies are producing suboptimal levels of talent today, and that infringes upon my well-being as a retiree some years hence. Uh, and that's, that's worrisome. So that's the question that we have to deal with. Um, how could we maximize the human capital potential in our society and at the same time ensure equal opportunities? The two hang together. Uh, we're basically going uphill in terms of ensuring a more equal opportunity society and maximizing our latent talent. We're walking uphill in several respects. One is we know that the human capital ante, if anybody here plays poker, you know where that is, you have to pay to participate, is rising and is rising rapidly with the ongoing uh, development of the knowledge economy. Uh, the knowledge economy in particular puts a premium on cognitive abilities. So I start here now with kind of a panorama of where are we today in terms of the talent pool of youngsters today that are going to be uh, the adults tomorrow, the productive labor force tomorrow. We can measure it in two ways. I'm going to measure it in terms of the proportion of young today who have nothing but obligatory basic schooling. They are condemned to bad life. The other one, the other indicator I use here is from PISA study data on cognitive abilities. And I'm going to measure it here via quantitative kind of met, uh, uh, mathematics type abilities to understand. All right? <coughs> if we look at the proportion of youngsters today who have nothing more than basic schooling, they're un going to be unprepared for the knowledge economy, that's for sure. We see huge nation differences. The country in which I live, Spain, performs extremely poor. Cohort after cohort after cohort, about one third of all youngsters fall by the wayside. Nothing but basic education. Uh, on the other hand, there are great performers. Finland is always singled out. Sweden is doing quite well. My home country, Denmark, a little bit less well. We have a very large proportion who go into post-obligatory education and then drop out. 
very high proportion, particularly in more practical skills uh, training. These huge differences we see replicated also in terms of measured cognitive abilities. Uh, now, when newspapers present the latest PISA results, they present all the trivial, uninteresting information. That is, is Sweden doing a little bit better or a little bit worse than Germany or Denmark or Spain, Finland or other countries? It's totally uninteresting. What's interesting is the spread and distribution behind the mean. And I've singled out two indicators. One is the dysfunctional, cognitively dysfunctional group that don't understand or can use basic information. The other one is what I call the elite, those who score way at the top, the Bill Gates uh, of tomorrow. Now to just illustrate what it means to be cognitively dysfunctional, one of the tests they use in PISA to single out this is whether you can understand the message on an aspirin bottle, which as you know says, no more than two tablets every six hours, if pain continues, consult a doctor. If a 15-year-old cannot understand what the meaning of that is, is, that kid is labeled as dysfunctional, falls below the minimum. So that's very basic. Now again, what we see here are huge nation differences in both the size of the dysfunctional group, ranging from about 20% against Spain, US also has a very large group of dysfunctionals, to relatively modest proportions in countries like the Nordic and including also France. Uh, what you notice when you compare the minimum column with the elite column is there's no correlation. Some countries have low on both, Denmark, it's a very homogeneous, kind of lowest common denominator maybe. Uh, others look very polarized. US is an extreme case of polarization. They have a very large elite. They also have a very large dysfunctional group. Uh, and that is, uh, in a way, also the case for Sweden, surprisingly. Sweden looks a bit polarized. It has about 10%, uh, whereas 11% elite, but it also has a 12% of youth that are essentially cognitively dysfunctional. <coughs> that should be worrying. So, in terms of basic indicators, we clearly are doing less well than we could. This, these differences across countries clearly cannot be ascribed to genetic differences. I don't think anybody here would argue that the Finns are genetically superior to the Swedes, <laughs> uh, except maybe if there's a Finn here. <laughs> uh, Denmark does look impressive. I don't think that we have an inferior gene pool than other countries either. These are institutionally created differences. Something in the institutional makeup of these societies, interplay between families and other institutions, is clearly what's driving this. And that's what I'm going to try to get at. Before I get at it, I, was, I mentioned that we're going uphill. The struggle is really an uphill struggle to improve our cap human capital potential. There's bad news on a lot of fronts. One factor we know that influences intergenerational mobility, or the life chances, or social inheritance, you might call it, has to do with income distribution. The more unequal is the income distribution, the more we will expect to find strong social inheritance. The correlation between origin and destination of a child will get stronger. I'm going to illustrate this with this little graph. This shows the correlation of elasticity, if, you're, if you know something about statistics. The elasticity or the correlation or the connection, strength of the connection between the income position of your parents of origin and your own income when you become an adult yourself. The red <coughs> columns in this graph show this correlation and the blue column shows the level of income inequality in the society. You can see that the two columns tend to march together. The more you have in income inequality, the greater you have social inheritance effects. So in countries with a very unequal income distribution like the UK, like the US, you also have very strong social inheritance. 
On the other extreme, Denmark in this case is a uh, kind of a, a, an exemplar case of equal opportunities. The correlation between parent income and child income is extremely low. It's less than a third as strong as it is in the US or the UK. Sweden is somewhere in between, and I think Sweden could do it better. Uh, but the bad news here, in terms of doing it better, is that almost all advanced economies are experiencing a huge increase in income inequalities. Income inequality. Whether it's going to plateau or not is an open question for the future. But we have experienced over the past 10, 15, 20 years a massive increase in inequality, which should have the effect that children born now are going to have more experience of social inheritance than kids that were born in the 60s, 70s. One area in which we see polarization tendencies in society. We're Struggling uphill on other fronts, particularly with regard to family structure. Uh, in the good old days, when I was young, when I was a kid, the woman most likely to get divorced was a high educated career woman. She was also very unlikely to get married in the first place. Who is most likely to get divorced today? Low educated. The highly educated are getting more and more stable. The same goes for the chance of becoming a lone parent, which is 90% means lone mothers. It's increasingly concentrated and is rising among very low educated women. It's falling among, in the, among the high educated. What this to me spells is family polarization. Because we do know that family instability and growing up with a lone parent has very adverse consequences for children's schooling and subsequent development. So if it's increasingly concentrated at the bottom of society, we, we should expect more and more polarization and more, more strong social inheritance effects. Not only that, but we also see polarization on yet another factor which is crucial for child stimulation and child preparation, namely parent investment in children. I'm not talking here about buying them candy. I'm talking about active stimulation of the children's learning abilities, cognitive development, etc., etc. What some people might call developmental care of the kids. What we see is a huge increase in parent time investment in the kids at the top of the social ladder. This is particularly driven by high educated fathers, which over the past 15, 20 years, have more than doubled their time with the kids. But also highly educated women working full time have also increased their child time. And especially in favor of development, developmental learning kind of activities such as reading to the kids. This has not happened at the bottom. So the time investment of parenting plus the content of the parenting is becoming polarized in a very big way. And it, this is illustrated through this simple little graph that plots the percent of parents that read to their kids every day by socioeconomic status. The bottom being down here, the bottom and the top up here. And you can see about high educated parents read twice as much, or more, twice as much likely to read to their kids as our low educated parents. Another trend towards polarization. There has been a lot of debate about the impact of immigration on school, schooling, educational outcomes, and in terms of overall social inequalities. We have to be quite careful when we discuss the immigrant effect, because we often confound what are not true immigrant effects, but simply the fact that immigrant families tend to be lower educated they may have less income, they may have more kids. That's not an immigrant effect, because they're also low income, low educated families in, in Sweden or in Denmark with lots of kids. So when we look at immigrant effects, we have to make sure that we net out or control for these kinds of factors to get at what is a true immigrant effect. These are, again, PISA-based estimates of 
the performance differential between immigrant kids and native-born kids, in the case of Sweden, Swedish kids versus the immigrants, in terms of PISA scores. In some countries, if you just look at the raw immigrant effect, it looks dramatic, particularly in, and strangely enough, in countries that speak German. And you say, hey, well, there's also Belgium here. Yeah, but this is only data from Flanders and Netherlands. Uh, German-speaking countries have some, an extreme differential between immigrant and non-immigrant population, maybe because the language is so difficult, I don't know. Uh, Scandinavia tends to lie in between, and some countries have a relatively modest differential, such as, for example, the UK. Uh, or for that matter, a few Spain, because a huge amount of immigration in Spain are from Latin America. But if we net out factors that are not <coughs> relevant for immigrants per se, get the net adjusted effect, then it diminishes dramatically. And in some countries, it turns positive. Ireland, the US, for example, it turns positive. The immigrants are doing better than the native population. Has obviously something to do with the composition of the immigrant groups. Ireland has been very high human capital immigrants to a large part. The US hides uh, an internal bimodality or polarization. The Mexican immigrants, of Latin America, but it's probably the Mexican, are doing very, very poorly. But the Asians are doing really, really well, better than Native Americans. It, these kinds of numbers, not just in terms of immigrants, but also for the native populations, also hide another huge and rising differential between boys and girls. In fact, recent Danish data tell us that the best performers of all are immigrant girls. The worst performers, immigrant boys. But also, in terms of the natives, the girl advantage is quite remarkable. On anything you can look at in terms of schooling, educational achievement, or in terms of these kinds of more cognitive or whatever tests. The girls do so much more well than the boys. And the trend seems to be that it's the boys are, the boy effect is worsening. So we might have to think about what are we going to do about the boys. So all in all, we are facing very serious polarizing tendencies in our societies today that are multiple, cumulative, and that are all going in the same kind of problematic direction, namely distancing the bottom of society from the rest, and at the same time, the top is galloping away. This must influence child life chances. And that's what we're going to figure out. Uh, what have we learned? One thing that we've learned is, in fact, that these kinds of relationships in terms of social inheritance effects, the relationship between origin and destination of a person, are non-linear, what we call non-linear. There's no real strong effects in the middle of the society. It's all happening at the two tail ends, in the bottom and in the very top. That's where you have to find really strong social inheritance effects. If you look at this table, which again has to do with the income mobility across generations, that is, what is the chance here of a son falling in the same income quantile as his papa? In, uh, and I, I'm comparing here four countries, uh, two good ones and two bad ones, we might say. Uh, and I'm looking at children who came from the bottom quintile, that's equivalent to, say, poverty, or in the top inquile, you might call that the bourgeoisie, and then the, the middle quintiles. Now, if you look at this, it's really striking. Uh, either if you look uh, horizontally or if you look uh, vertically. If you look horizontally, the middle group is hovering all of about 20% which is what would you would expect if it was statistically purely random. There must always be 20% in the quintile, by definition. So there's no kind of bias in the middle. 
There's a likely there's not to end up in the same, but there's no there's no bias. Look at the bottom, and you'll see Denmark and Sweden are doing quite well in the bottom. The chance of a child coming from the bottom also ending up there is just slightly above what we statistically random. 25% in Denmark, 26% in Sweden. Compare that to the US, 42% end up in the same bottom quintile as the papa. A huge difference. There's almost twice as much social inheritance from the bottom in the US as in Scandinavia. Scandinavians have done something. That has diminished compared to other countries significantly the blocked opportunities from the very bottom. And I'm going to show you again. But then look at the top. There, Scandinavia looks identical to the US or UK. Again, a huge overrepresentation of kids who came from the rich that also end up themselves being rich. There's no difference here. What I think is happening here is that very high income families can overinvest in their kids. And I, there is a lot of evidence that there is a lot of overinvestment happening. They're protecting their kids against downward mobility and they have the resources to do so. Uh, this is what I call the George Bush effect. That if you're very rich, you can protect even the stupidest kid in the country <laughs> against downward mobility. So what Scandinavia has done, apparently, is a very asymmetric attack on unequal opportunities. Concentrating on lifting the bottom, but have not touched the top. And that's quite surprising. You can see the same in a way, sorry, when you look at this. Here I'm comparing across cohorts. Cohort three is my generation, born around 1950, around that early 50s. Cohort two, born in the 60s. Cohort three, born in, in the early 70s. Basically, that's what these cohorts are represented. And then looking at, these are odds ratios, uh, log odds ratios, uh, on what is the probability by cohort of making it into tertiary level education if you came from a very low skilled social background. The father was basically unskilled. Now if you look at the US, the numbers look very similar from cohort to cohort. There has been no increase in the chances of these kids moving up in the education ladder. The same you could say for the UK, the same you could say for Germany. But ignore Norway, by the way, I'm not certain about the Norwegian estimates, but Denmark and Sweden are solid. And they're going both the same direction. But when did it happen? There's not much change from cohort three to cohort two. The big jump is when cohort three enters the state. Timing-wise, this coincides with one important thing. When was it that attending preschool, kindergarten, child care centers in Scandinavia became the norm? In the 1970s, that's when it exploded. Cohort three is the first child care, external child care cohort in Scandinavia. This is just suggestive, but this is what opens up for the big question. Is childcare, or does it promote human capital? Does it promote more equal life chances? James Heckman would say yes. And this is, I think everybody here is familiar with James Heckman, Nobel Prize winner in economics, who now for more than a decade has been concentrating all his substantial intellect and intelligence on one question whether early childhood stimulation is, and how much decisive it is for a later performance of kids. What has happened to people like me and him and everybody working in this area is that compared to the old days, we, we have suddenly talked to child psychologists and people from the medical profession in terms of understanding the developmental logic in childhood. And if we had talked to the child psychologists 
earlier, we would have known a long time ago that the crucial window of opportunity lies in the first five, six, seven years of the child's life. <clears throat> if it goes right, in, in those early years, children will learn very well later on. They will do very well. If it goes wrong in the first years, it's very difficult to fix the problem later on. It's our via remedial type programs. It also tells us another thing, that all our reform efforts in the post-war era to create an equal opportunity society, a la Olaf Palme's big education reform, or their partners across the world, went, were wrong-headed. They thought that if we can change the education system so that all kids stay longer in the same school, promote uh, more uh, education, then we'll fix the opportunity problem. We will reduce class differences. What we know now is that, that was what, in a vulgar American way, we say ass backwards. Because it all begins earlier. What we know, for example, as a rule of thumb, and this comes out of PISA data too, is that a child that has uh, been in a good quality preschool institution will be one year ahead of the rest of the kids, even when they start school, the first day of school. They are way ahead of the rest. In fact, had we just talked to primary school teachers, they would have told us the same thing. Children who come from a good child care program or from a good kindergarten are so much ahead of the rest of the kids when they start the first day of school. This is the logic of Heckman's so-called learning begets learning model, which is a synergy model that has a logic that the payoff to any stimulus or investment in kids in their very earliest years is extremely steep. And then the payoff starts declining and flattens fairly early. Already by age 17, it becomes pretty flat. It means, in, in, in terms of the way that James Heckman thinks, and he thinks like an economist, when he evaluates the efficacy of these kinds of programs, he thinks of it in terms of cost-benefit. So what is the return to every dollar invested in terms of its net results later. The dynamic cost-benefit analysis. The cost-benefit both, both has to take into consideration costs. For example, a child that starts badly will need a lot of remedial programs, very expensive, maybe more likely to end up in criminality, extremely expensive, will earn later on in life, extremely costly to society if they need social assistance benefits and so forth and so on. Maybe they will also become poor parents later on. Or if you do well in the beginning, then you will learn much more effectively. You don't need remedial programs. You're a very effective learner, and you swim through the education system very effectively. Heckman's estimates, based on American inter early intervention programs, conclude by and large, that for each US dollar invested at this stage, you obtain a return to the investment of somewhere around $9. That's a fantastic investment. Uh, and I challenge anybody to go to the Swedish stock market and find anything that would produce a yield even faintly comparable to that. All right. Now, had we talked to experts, for example, on brains, they would have said, the moment where you really should stimulate child's brain development is in the first years. In the very first year is really important. Brain malleability, the receptivity of the brain to impulses, is huge in the first in the few years years of the child's life. And then follows a curve that's very similar to the one we just saw in the Hickman's learning because of learning curve. Uh, by age 10, it's already pretty flat. 
So if the stimulus of the brain was suboptimal in the first years, there's, there, it's going to be virtually a permanent <coughs> loss in terms of the put, brain's potential. Now look at how we actually invest across the life course of children. Exactly the contrary to the logic. We invest per child very little in early preschool education programs or whatever. And we start spending something on them when they reach kindergarten age, but not very much. Then when they reach school, in primary and secondary school, we start spending more. And we spend more and more and more the further they are away from their optimal stimulation points. And that's basically what uh, Heckman and virtually everybody working in this field right now are saying. We've got to rethink our priorities in terms of public policy in favor of children and families. Put the money where it's really effective in the very early years, and then you don't need to spend so much later on. We know remedial programs are hugely expensive and very inefficient. We know that when it goes really wrong, one year in jail is as costly as one year's tuition at Harvard University. The price is identical. That's also a nice thing to, to tell the politicians. Uh, in other words, shifting our emphasis to the first six years seems to be a good idea. How? Uh, let me go through a little bit, show you a little bit evidence that we have is primarily from US research. I'm going to also show you some recent stuff I've done comparing Denmark and the US with a colleague of mine, uh, Jane Walford, who maybe somebody has heard of her. She's one of the prominent US people working in this kind of area. Here's a first stab at it. Here we compare kids across three types of skill levels of the family, of the father. In terms of, did they attend a quality preschool? Yes or no? You can see that the premium of having attended preschool is substantial across all family types, whether it's an unskilled father, whether it's a skilled father, or whether it is kind of a professional kind of family. And it's a substantial gain. It's something to the order of 25% extra gain, these kids get in terms of their literacy abilities that they measured at age seven. Now, this isn't testing their ability to do to ABC correctly, or read Proust or Dostoevsky. It's their ability to comprehend the language. Here's another way of looking at it, in terms of their achievements. One, uh, later on in school, again, American data, uh, the red represents kids that were in a, a preschool program. The green is they were not. Look at it in terms of their basic uh, uh, intellectual achievement. Uh, it, 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 what, 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 like, what likelihood of a good achievement of tests uh, they would have. The difference is enormous, whether they went to preschool or not. Look also at the probability of graduating from high school. Huge difference, 20 point difference if you went to a good preschool. Uh, or look here at the savings side of the cost benefit analysis. What is the probability of remedial action of kids, for example, in terms of that they are behind mentally uh, in school? If you were in, in a good quality childcare, you are uh, half, less than half as likely as needing any kind of remedial program as if you had not been. It's a big, big, these are really big differences. Or look at what we save in terms of social assistance benefits, the Americans call it welfare benefits. Uh, if you were in, in a quality preschool program, you're only 59% likely compared to those if you, they were not there, 80% likely. 
these are only children, remember, who come from underprivileged backgrounds. And almost all American evaluation research is focused exactly on these kinds of programs targeted very much to the most at risk underprivileged kids. Some of you may be familiar with some of the more famous of these programs, like the Abecedarian, the Paris School experiment, and others of these. They're very local experiments, small, highly targeted to really at risk kids. And that's why you get these kinds of effects. This one I like a lot because this one is again measuring reading comprehension of kids. Uh, if I remember right, we are now examining about age 15, 16, if I remember right, something like that. End of obligatory schooling. Uh, and again, we're comparing, but now, whether they went to a high quality or not preschool. And this needs to be underlined, because the positive impacts of good quality preschool depends almost exclusively on the quality of the, of the care institutions. And we're looking at the effects across a, a group of, of different clientels that tend to be at high risk, especially in the US. Lone mother kids really do poorly. Non-English evidence is an immigrant kid. Low mother education speaks for itself, or poverty, income poverty. Now look at the effects. They are very substantial, especially the ones for the low educated mother. The huge effects. In fact, if you went to a low quality preschool, there's no substantive gain whatsoever in this case. It's only if it's high quality. And that is more or less the story across all kinds of groups of families. The real gains happen when it's high quality. In fact, low quality centers uh, have been shown to have adverse effects, not so much on the intellectual performance, but on behavioral performance. Very negative. So there clearly is something here that uh, is, is operating very positively. Now, what do we know about the mechanisms that produce problem outcomes? Here we are into slippery terrain. Uh, there is, I have already mentioned some of the factors that are clearly, that clearly impinge on, such as low motherhood, insta family instability, divorce, all that has very negative consequences for the children. But there is one factor that above all predicts bad outcomes, which is poverty and family. Here in Scandinavia, we do very well in terms of minimizing child poverty. Uh, it has been quite stable around four to five percent of children experience poverty. But what's even more important, it's relatively short-lived poverty. Long-term persistent poverty is very, very small in Scandinavia. That is not the case in the US, where it's exactly the opposite. Neither is the case in Spain, where in the US and in Spain, we have somewhere between 17 to 20% of kids living in poverty, and it tends to be long-term poverty. It has devastating consequences. The estimates are that a child from poverty will have, on average, two years less schooling than a non poor child. They will subsequently, as adults, earn about 30% less than the non poor children. And the probability of them becoming then poor parents themselves is twice as high as the rest. They are reproducing that syndrome from generation to generation. But the uncertainty lies in the fact we don't know to what extent it's a true, purely income type effect, or whether this is driven by parent characteristics that, in the first place, explain also why they ended up poor. It could be they're drug addicts, mentally problematic. It could be they're lazy, sloppy people. It could be all kinds of reasons that explain not only why they were poor, but also why their children do poor. We have been rather unable to separate out these effects in a clear way. I think everybody would agree that the income effect is there, but we don't know how much it kind of goes together with all these other kind of effects lying behind there and kind of bubbling under the surface. We really can't get at it because 
We don't have data that tell us whether mama or papa are, are sloppy people or lazy people or, or screwed up or unorganized or whatever. The case for the poverty, the income poverty effect is clear. Right? One thing we know, for example, that happens as a syndrome in, in poor families is that they wrestle from day to day just to get by. That means they have no resources left over in order to give the children anything. Uh, they also have very bad nutrition and so forth and so on. We know, for example, that poverty has hugely adverse health effects on children. The chance of a child dying before the age of 14 is twice as high among children growing up in poverty. All right. Uh, the question then becomes whether these early programs and when, how may they have an especially positive effect for children who are most at risk. We have already seen some data that shows, yes, it seems to be the case that at least children who have preschool experience of this quality, they do better. But we haven't really looked at the marginal effect. Is it much bigger for the more at risk kids than others? In which case, it would have that equalizing effect that I started talking about. Uh, and here I will move to, th this is a study I just finished actually uh, a month ago with uh, Jane Walfolk, where we managed miraculously to find data that is completely par uh, comparable for the US and for Denmark. In Denmark, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic data set called Manifolutes and Oscars that started with a cohort born in 1996 and has been following it up. Uh, and this is the kind of data I've been analyzing here. You remember I emphasized at one point that these kinds of effects are nonlinear. That's exactly what we find both in the US and in Denmark. The greatest beneficiaries of quality preschool, kindergarten, and daycare are the most vulnerable kids, and the kids from the bottom of the side. I've used quantile regression here to estimate the effect across the distributions. And as you'll see, the big effects are here, in the bottom 20% of society. With a little bit of a positive effect here, that is just barely significant, and then it flattens out to nothing for the top end of society. So the marginal effect, if you, in the Danish context, went to high quality, center-based care is very big for the bottom end. That's also the case in the US. This is a US graph. They're not strictly comparable because the metrics are a bit different. But the effect size is about the same in the US. In fact, it's bigger than in the US. Again, in the bottom. But compared to the danger, which was very steep, up to 0.2, and then a day after it ran rather flat, the US remains steep, somewhat longer, up to 0.4 almost. That is, the bottom 40% of American society has a huge additional marginal extra benefit out of having attended high quality childcare programs. And then it flattens out. But then we discovered something that really, in the first round, puzzled us a lot. In the, Denmark, in the Danish case, those positive effects are persistent. When we later, when we measured the children not only at age six, but also at age 11, uh, and, and, and or when they were bitten, like when they were older. In the US, they didn't. There was, this, these effects are when, when they were strong, when they were six, seven years, when they were in the beginning of the elementary school, then they start vanishing, disappear. And that really worried us. What could that be? And there's something, this is something that all research in this area has never really been aware of. Namely, that these positive effects, they have to be reinforced year by year in a child's youth via high quality schools. Now, what happened here in the US, we found out finally, was that there were a significant amount of preschool kids in the US that happened by luck or whatever to come into a fairly high quality 
preschool program benefited hugely. But what happened after that? They ended up in the local ghetto school, very low quality, and it was undone. Which tells us that uh, if we are too myopically focused solely on stimulating the zero to six ages, and then let the rest just sort of go as it goes, we're wrong. And as I was preparing to come here and, and tell you about all this stuff, it occurred to me that because a couple of years ago I was sent by the OECD to Sweden to evaluate the Swedish education system. And I remember one of our central points of criticism was the post-reforms, post-privatization reforms, which was called deregulation reforms of the Swedish school system. And we noticed clearly increased segmentation, and uh, uh, in particular by immigrant groups, and more differentiation and kind of some vaguely polarizing tendencies in the Swedish school system. If that continues, you may actually be moving in this kind of American direction where your high quality kindergartens effects are going to be undone by an increasingly segregated uh, primary school system. There, I think Denmark is actually doing better. And the reason that it, the, those early effects were not canceled out in Denmark is because Denmark probably has one of the most homogeneously high quality primary school systems in any OCD country. And we tested that. And there is, there, there, there is no effect on whatever kind of school you went to in terms of later performance of the kids in Denmark. Absolutely none. It doesn't matter if you're from Hubo or from Bovenhagen or Olds or when you, what kind of school, zero effect. I don't know for Sweden, and it would be interesting if somebody could estimate this for Sweden. I'm afraid there aren't really very good data for Sweden to do it. You need a, this kind of child panel like Denmark has to do it. So if any of you kind of um, are good at raising research money, that would be a very good investment in financing a child panel like we have in Denmark and the kind we have in the US and in other countries. So that more or less wraps up what uh, I wanted to say, but I, I wanted to end up with my, if anybody is friends with some politicians, then give them this slogan. All good reforms begin with babies. And I think that is sort of sums it all up. Bara upp med näven om ni har någon fråga till Jöska. Och ni får ställa frågan på svenska eller danska om ni vill det eller på engelska. Det är bara på det. Uh, in the France, they begin in the school when they were six years old. And I wonder if uh, they were more educated and we, because we, we start when we were seven years old. Are the difference between France and Sweden uh, uh, before or now? Do you understand my questions? That in Scandinavia you begin school at age seven instead of six. Yes, yeah. we, we began when seven, late, uh, before. And now we began at, at six. But France start at six, long before us. So I wonder if there was a difference between France and Sweden. There are two ways of answering that question. One is, I think there's a very good case to say that the girls should start at age six, the boys at age seven. Uh, the boys are behind. Uh, the, but the other, the other way to answer the question is, uh, when do you start learning? Now, Danish pedagogy has it all wrong. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Danish pedagogues, but preschool pedagogy in Denmark is swears to the dogma that it's not about learning. It's about holding hands, sociability, feeling integrated, and be a happy little child, singing songs. So that's what they do in kindergarten. I know it from personal experience because my Danish, no, my kids went to a Danish kindergarten, and that's all they did. Went for a walk in the woods and sang songs. Whereas French, or Spanish, <coughs> by the way, uh, kindergarten pedagogy, they should not. Of course, they don't start 
doing arithmetic. They don't start doing uh, you know heavy stuff, but they're starting to stimulate their learning process very actively. They're learning things. They even learn foreign languages. Uh, my kids, they also went to kindergarten in Spain and in Barcelona, and they had two hours of English every week. Yeah. Now, that's the logic that comes from understanding both child psychologists and brain experts and all the stuff I laid out. We shouldn't artificially say, we start learning at age six or maybe seven, what's best? Both. Uh, both of six and seven are wrong. They're bad ages. You should start at age one. What is an important little kind of a parenthesis in this scenario is that experts in that area, more closer to child psychology, have concluded that externalized care in the first year of the child's life has adverse effects. More on the behavioral front than on the cognitive front. Because apparently, the foundations for good learning later depend very much on feeling very kind of uh, um, assimilated and secure in the first year of the life. That means that's a, there's a strong premium on being maximally with the parents in the first year. So children that are that are externalized in terms of care too early, they have adverse effects on them. And that has been observed quite a lot. There's a very famous expert in this area called Christopher Rule, who's done a lot of studies of this, and it comes out that all the time. From age one, if the care is high quality, uh, there are no adverse effects. They're all positive, if it's quality. And the cognitive dividend is especially high, of course, if there is a strong cognitive stimulus content of the pedagogy. Uh, and, and again, repeat, it's quality pedagogy. Right? And that is where I think Scandinavia has gone wrong. It, the the pedagog pedagogy for the preschool stage has been too much holding hands and singing the songs and feel good, and too little stimulation of, of the kids. And I think that is especially to the dis disadvantage of the boys. So that's how I would answer that question. OK, we have another question here. Två saker. Först en kommentar och andra en fråga. För att jag tycker det var en positiv bild av barnfattigdomsutveckling i Skandinavien och Sverige. När man tittar på siffror som vi har varit med på att göra så ser vi liksom att barnfattigdomstalen går upp. Beroende då på hur man definierar naturligtvis. Men om man utgår från 60 procent av medianen så är det ingen tvekan om att de har gått upp hos oss. Och det beror på att historien på att det vi kan se är alltså att en större och större andel är invandrar. Och det är inte bara i Sverige, det är även i Danmark och Norge. Så det första. Det andra är att du pratar mycket om utveckling av humankapital och hur det beror på när man är ung. Men när man sen kommer till den åldern att man ska börja förvärvsarbeta, då måste man hitta ett arbete. Och om jag förstår forskningen rätt så pekar det åt det hållet att det hjälper inte för många invandrarbarn om man har bra betyg. Man får ändå inte jobb i stor utsträckning. Så jag skulle gärna höra kommentarer om den typen av frågor. Det verkar som att i, i norra Europa vi får fler och fler invandrare, unga invandrare som inte får jobb även om de har god utbildning. Og hvad du, du siger, det er muligt sandt. Altså de seneste sammenlignende tal, vi har på børnefattigdom, er fra 2005 deromkring. Det er dem, jeg bruger. Uh, det er muligt, at her de sidste par år, at fattigdom uh, en, er forøget. Det kunne man forvente på grund af krisen og forøget arbejdsløsheden osv. Og og uh, vi har bare ikke sammenlignende data, der, der tillader os at se det. Uh, men uh, sådan, hvor man har et... At, 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 bidder at tal fra et par lande, for eksempel. Jeg har lige set nogle estimeringer, de seneste estimeringer fra Spanien, og fra de sidste to-tre år her i krisen, fra 2008 fremad op til 2010. Og der var der en mærkbar fremgang, eller opgang i, i børnefattigdom i Spanien. Det kunne man forvente i de fleste lande. Så det er helt sikkert rigtigt, hvad du siger. Og det vil sige, at 
at det der med, at vi, vi kæmper op ad bakken, er endnu mere op ad bakken, ikke? Og, og det rammer helt klart nok mere emigrantfamilier end andre. Pointen, nummer, det, eller din anden point, det er selvfølgelig også rigtigt nok, men det kommer ind på, hvad er, det, hvad er det for et perspektiv, vi lægger på det? Her, det, det er jo klart, hvis du er krisetider, så er der mere chance for, at mange af de her børn, selvom de med til den fuld ender i arbejdsløsheden, når de bliver voksne, end hvis det er go go økonomi. Og min betragtning her, er rent mikro i den forstand her, er der, hvad, hvad, hvordan forøges deres chancer? For eksempel hvis du sammenligner Frederik og Jens. Jens kommer fra fattig, Frederik kommer fra borgerskabet. Og selvfølgelig Frederik så har store fordele, men kan vi udjævne og gøre fordelene mere ens mellem de to? Ja. Det vil altså sige, at Jens' chancer for at komme i et godt job forøges betydeligt, hvis det er det, det sker. Det er, det er min betragtningsmåde. Så er det jo noget helt andet selvfølgelig, at de, de, de står ansigt til ansigt med et dårligt arbejdsmarked. Og det er selvfølgelig især for immigranterne. Men selvom vi nu kigger i stedet for Frederik og Jens, på Hassan og Mohammed, ikke? så øh, øh, Hassan, selvom om, om, om der er diskrimination på arbejdsmarkedet, han vil have større chancer for at få et ordentligt job, hvis han har bedre egenskaber osv., osv., end hvis han ikke havde. Så det kommer an på, hvad det for et perspektiv, du lægger på spørgsmålet. Jeg har, jeg har lagt hele spørgsmålet frem som, som en slags mikrobetragtning. Og Att kissa på relationer där mellan inkomstfällarna har att vara sina barn på de dagarna. Så jag undrar i vilken utsträckning som dina siffror har kontrollerat för den typen av faktorer. För Danmark är det väldigt simpelt. För för det kort vi tittar på, det var basically tre alternativ. Either it was centerbaserat, what we call centerbaserat kommunal institutioner, high, very high quality extremely high quality. Or it was with mama, that's very few, it was about 20%, and maybe immigrant children or out in the countryside. And the third was what in Danish called familia ply. It was a stopgap measure in Denmark uh, because the supply of center places was insufficient. And so it was basically paying some woman with minimal training to take some kids in during the day. It's a parking lot, essentially. So that is our big contrast for Denmark. US was really complicated because the system is so heterogeneous and essentially private, except for Head Start and Early Head Start. It's essentially all private. With very, it's difficult to measure quality. We did it more by an exclusionary principle. We decided, first of all, Head Start is low quality. It doesn't mean that all Head Start is low quality. It just means it tends to be more low quality and high quality. But it's very uneven across municipalities, across states, across everything. Uh, also Head Start, which is the biggest program for that, the, the only really big public program, is only very short hours. It's four, four hours a day, uh, very targeted. So we decided that is not high quality. Uh, but il but uh, the elimination, we, we thought we had a group a kind of a box that we call, this is probably pretty good quality. Uh, whether it is homogeneously as high quality as the Danish, that's a really doubtful. Right? But we contrasted what we know is really bad quality against our box that we think is pretty good. That's more or less what we did for the US. Um, you're right about that the US system is essentially market driven and very costly if it's quality, very high, very high prices. But they would be the same if in Scandinavia it was a satellite. Right. Essentially, a place in a high quality center in the US, if you had two kids, would eat up the entire earnings of the mother if she was a full time employee with mean income. Oh, question. Uh, I agree with what you say, but I'm afraid that it may end up in holding in the wind. And the reason is that we, what we have seen over the last 30, 40 years, both in the US and in Europe, is that the politicians tend to spend more and more money on well-to-do retired people, and less and less money on families with children. 
And you can see that very clearly in the US when, if you compare the poverty rates, for example. And the, the, I think what's lacking in your presentation is a discussion of electoral reforms. Because politicians are basically going where the votes are. So unless you will have, I think, a huge electoral reform, giving basically families with children right to vote for their children, this will never happen. And you could clearly see this in our latest election now, where the left parties, in a desperate move to win elections, made phenomenal promises to retired people for tax deductions, but nothing for poor families or families with children. So I think, with all due respect, without a discussion of sort of how to change the political power game, this will never happen. I leave that to the political scientists. <laughs> Absolut. Nej, det er ikke som jeg siger, enten skal de i skoven, eller også skal de sidde og lave regnestykker. Det, det, det var ikke det, der var meningen. Det var vægten. Altså, i Danmark, I ved ikke så meget om pædagogik i Sverige, men i Danmark er pædagogikken 100% feel good. Ja? Og der, der er ingen indlæring overhovedet, og de nægter, pædagogerne nægter at komme med på sådan noget. Og det er det, der er problemet. Ikke? Det er ikke sådan, at de skal sidde på skolebænk. De er startet tre år, og de kan jo ikke sidde på en skolebænk til seks timer i træk. Ja? Um, men det er bare, hvad, hvad type stimulering får de her. De får næsten ingen hjernestimulering. Selvfølgelig. Man, læ man lærer noget at gå i skoven. Hey, der er rådyr, ikke? Og hey, der er en rev. Og sådan, så lærer de, hvad en rev er, ikke? Og, eller en blomst og sådan noget. Det lærer, de lærer selvfølgelig noget, ikke? Det er ikke sådan, at det er læringstomt. Det er bare det, jeg snakker om, det er vægten. Hvordan at, at pædagogikken, I skal lave. Og det, der er stor, der er stor debat i Danmark om det her, ikke? Pædagogerne, altså, det er rasende. Men jeg tror, at hele den danske befolkning er begyndt at indse, at der burde være meget mere du skal få lidt en stor tak, Nesna. Selv tak. Og du skal også få lidt den næste og første år, og det er Thomas Forslund. Tak, kan man også forstå på svensk.